But yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is David, and I am local artist Bruce Banter, just to kind of get that out of the way. Um, in case you're wondering, the band is Sheer Mag. They're great. They're from Philly, if you don't know them. If you like rock and roll, check them out. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess we're here, and no one else is here, and that's okay. So, uh, David, we are recording this, and we'll be able to share it with uh, we can put it across our socials and we'll be able to put it out there and let people be able to to catch up if they join in a little bit later mm -hmm. um, so you know you had uh just mentioned you you said i'm bruce banter can you tell us a little bit about where that that moniker came from or that that alias as people have been so calling many it people are so having, many people like is that yeah. the name <laughs> yeah no i i get that a lot i mean and, and it's kind of one of those funny things like using a moniker with a real actual first name um that isn't weird is um you know people do meet me and say like hey bruce and then they third fourth fifth time they see me until i correct them or someone else does um you know hey I'm, my name's actually david but but yeah no so i i i grew up in a, a very colorful world um illustration comic books video games movies pictures photographs like i really just like looking at stuff and bright colors kind of really struck out. So comic books was a big thing. I had um, a relative who owned a comic book shop in North Carolina and we would summer every year down there and in South Carolina and visit them. Um, and it was a family business. And so we got to go down there all the time and he would give us swag and cool stuff. And he was also an illustrator and he would draw us Batman and Ninja Turtles and uh, that kind of stuff uh, when we were kids and my sister and I just ate it up because it was the 90s and that's just what you did and uh, what you liked and it was cool so um, I really got into Marvel and like the Hulk and, and that's kind of where this came from I also kind of cross that with my love for kind of being not necessarily two personalities but like having a more like humble version of myself and then uh kind of a more exacerbated version of myself and everybody has their anti ego and super ego and not everybody can express them um through themselves and i feel like uh, just because of who i am and how i was raised i'm able to do that uh, which is why it's fun for me to switch between mediums um both in art and music switch between genres in the music that i play and incorporate all of that into the bruce banter repertoire um, when you look at my work and see the pieces signed with two thirteens, that coincides with the fact that I was born on Friday the 13th and kind of stuck with that, like watched horror movies and was actually exposed to some scary stuff uh, on film as a young kid at an old babysitter. She had a son and like kind of sat me down with, you know, Jason and Freddie and dolls and Chucky. And I, I watched them at an early age. So it's kind of very desensitized to, uh, themes of horror as a kid. So I kind of put that into my work here and there. I love monsters. I love, you know, um, character design and everything that goes into uh, kind of, you know, creeping someone out with a visual. And I think that, that getting into someone's psyche with picture and film and art is just something that's just always been a part of me. And that kind of goes again with the comic books and the video games and the movies. And it's, how are these characters going to work together to affect the uh, protagonist? And I've always kind of seen myself as this antagonist, protagonist, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Bruce Banter, the Hulk, like, you know, uh, the, the T switch with the uh, other N kind of goes along with the fact that I've been making hip hop music since I was 16. And, uh, you know, so it's very convoluted and there's a whole lot that goes <laughs> into this moniker and this personality and it's just it's sometimes i get lost in talking about it but there really is like a very in-depth uh at this point perspective that i've taken on like myself creatively um and it's really fun to have fun with it and like uh i, I do i've drawn pieces that incorporated the hulk and i've, I've drawn spoofs of marvel stuff and I've incorporated hip hop and heavy metal themes from my music into my art and also the country Western stuff uh, that I really grew up and loved. And a lot of my landscapes are just from my travels out in New Mexico and Colorado and 
just being in the wilderness there and having personal time and not doing touristy stuff in those two states and just really falling in love with the big sky open great outdoor scenarios and so that that kind of seeps into it i make art and music because i love the art and music that i make um because of the art and music that influenced me you know so it's always the next step and so i think that then incorporating that aspect of having a dichotomy between me and my artist self and then i can just be dave like when i'm at work and like a lot of people don't even know that i do these things and it's kind of fun to like expose them to that and just know that like hey there's this guy who's just a guy who does a job and bartends and <laughs> cocktails and manages a little restaurant and and it's just it's fun to be two of me i guess yeah so there's there's the short and long of it that's short and long <laughs> and, and you know uh david when people come into the gallery and they're looking at the work when they well first thing they always say like oh i saw these from the street like the co the colors <laughs> the got colors my attention are vibrant. Uh, so i had to come down and take a look and then they read the statement that we prepared for it and they're like bruce banter sounds like a comic book and i'm like yeah okay well good <laughs> like he would totally, yeah, yeah. He would totally appreciate that, that. <laughs> and uh and I can, you know, even I can relate to the, like having the, the two different sides uh, of a, like an artistic personality and then like your, your normal self. Um, funny enough, even when I was in uh, undergraduate school at PCAD, one of my printmaking professors suggested that I adopt a new name but keep my initials uh, because uh, I told him that I, get, I didn't see printmaking like being in my, in my normal body of work, but I enjoyed it. He's like, oh, well, then just give yourself another name. So for a while, like he actually, he dubbed me uh, Mark Crowning. So when I made prints, I would sign them Mark Crowning and he'd hang them in the hallway and people, yeah, people would be like, who is Mark? And uh, it's so it's kind of like, it's, it's this weird thing. Like you can, you can almost kind of sit back and be a fly on the wall for yourself when exactly. somebody else is like, Oh, like, do you know who, who Bruce is? And like, oh, yeah, I might know who Bruce is. Maybe. Yeah. And, <laughs> even in the and then there's this, there's this just Dave guy over here, just like, you know, you know, just, so, you know, yeah. and that's just kind of like, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, and that comes from, you know, just like me growing up, like Lancaster County being very humble and like, you know, what was going on? I like plants and animals and that kind of stuff. But then I also really like, horror movies and hip hop and like going hard and hanging out and, and that kind of stuff. So it, there really are just, you know, two sides to the coin. And that's all, of course, personal life. And then, then of course, then I, there's the work me who's just a totally different person. And sometimes they, it, the emotions creep into this and that and you kind of got to separate them, but uh, that's just all part of growing up. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, in the gallery space, it's been, it's, it's been tough sometimes when like, I, I want to say, Oh, are you familiar with David's work? I'm like, wait, should I say David? <laughs> so I yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. I, and I'm not, I, I think when I was a little younger, when I conceptualized this thing, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, um, I was a little bit more of a stickler for it being like, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm that, yeah, Bruce Banter. Like, you know what I mean? It was just like this whole, the vibe like was, was totally different. And I feel like now that I've, I've gotten a lot older, I can switch into that mode, especially if I'm performing um, or, or if we're at an art gallery opening, which typically I would perform music at, um, then I can kind of get into that character and be that character. I think it's kind of um, fun to be just a for a Bruce Banter endeavor. And I think that this has kind of taught me to just, you know, be very, very humble and grown about the work that I've been making and, and you know, how I've been presenting it. And you guys have really helped with that. And I think that that um, is great to see in myself, um, you know, just growing as an artist. Excellent. Since you touched on color, like a little bit, like you obviously love to work with like fully saturated straight out of the bottle or out of the tube color. So many people have like, noticed that vibrancy and resonate with it like these particular pieces that we have up on the screen right now on the very back wall 
someone was like, this reminds me of Lisa Frank. And that was very 90s. Like I had a Lisa Frank yeah. pepper keeper. And it's just like, maybe this is an alternate world, Lisa Frank, because what, those were filled with like unicorns and like cuddly leopards that had <laughs> crazy colored spots. Yeah, and they like big Disney eyes. and But like, but you know, for the most part, um, you know, there's been a resurgence of that kind of neon chartreuse yellow and um, there's been a lot of hot pink and that orange showing up in uh, different things. And I just kind of embraced it because it really just brought me back to being there and, and it's available. I mean, when, especially as an artist, when there are, are marketable items that are out there for the taking, like you just have to grab onto them. And I have a lot of friends that do work in a lot of that hot pink and the chartreuse realm. And uh, when you guys got that orange, that vermilion orange i just fell in love with it straight out of the bottle and i was like don't touch it don't tamper it i've been making orange for years from scratch love making orange from scratch um i had a signature orange that i that i have in the the one boot illustration um the little the small one the blue one um that was like a signature orange that i created um we had the one on the left uh and I use that in hundreds of pieces. You know, I, I made like 200 pieces of artwork with that orange in it that I would make from scratch in a session. And it differed, of course, because of the day, but I would make it with typically the same uh, Dr. Martin's ink and I would let it dry out a little bit so that it would be a little glossier and, uh, you know, the science of the dilution and the saturation of, you know, your ink opacity and uh, viscosity is really important in creating signature uh, art. And they really nailed it with that ink. Like I didn't have to do it anymore for myself because it really did what I wanted it to do. Uh, so it was kind of cool to go through and just use it straight out of the bottle and then alleviate some, some of the stresses, you know, and it just kind of brings you back to that. Why are we paying so much for this art? It only took you so long to do it. Well, then maybe you haven't made orange a thousand times in a month, you know, like you, you get to pick the vermilion out of the bottle. If you've done thousands of orange swatches and tried to match them and they matched and, you know, we're doing grandma's pinches here. We're not measuring with cups. We're, we're really going for, for blind faith. And that orange is my go-to now because of that. Yeah. Nice. Well, yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, artists and like when artists are talking with other artists and, and even uh, like I, we've had, um, you know, people who would consider themselves non-artists who come into the, into the gallery and take a look at the work. The color is something that they always remark on. And, uh, and I think out of each person in, in some phrase or some combination of words, they say, man, he really gets color. Uh, and I, and then they, you know, they ask me, they're like, well, do you know how he did it? And I was, and I was like, I have a, an understanding of how some of these pieces were created. Um, uh, but you know, it's kind of like asking, you know, if you went up and, and, you know, asked the magician to reveal the, the illusion, <laughs> um, some of them are more than happy to, to open that vault and share all that knowledge. And I feel like you are someone who does that. Um, yeah, as, yeah, as yeah. an educator, I love doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, so when people ask, like, you know, we're, we're resting on this one now with the, uh, I think it's small rodent. Um, yes. People, people are like, so what came first? Was it the, was it the ink on the, was it the vibrant, the colors underneath of that? And then he drew over it or did that, or was the drawing there first and the ink is what went on second. And my speculation is that it was the ink first and drawing second. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, I think about, there's about five or six layers of work um for each of those characters um in in the vermilion border series um and it was kind of fun to just go through that gestalt and just really just work through the iterations and pick a different animal each time and like i would ask my girlfriend like hey what should i do next or should i do this or that and you know just kind of funny to go through the gamut of the different things you could pick and then go through the different techniques with each one uh, so i did the same techniques for each one i started actually with water uh, something you can do with really thick watercolor paper is to do an underpainting of just straight water. Um, get your basic outline shape, your silhouette in mind, you know, take a couple of 
years of practice on getting silhouettes in water and use your light. I usually use two light sources to be able to see the water from different angles. Um, and then I can get the outline of what I do. Uh, but it's pretty much, it's pretty loose anyway, because I really just love the cloud watching and imaginative aspects of just kind of having this weird little watery blob um, that you can kind of shape with a small paintbrush or two. And yeah. so, um, yeah, then I do the, drop some ink in, make some vibrant colors, do the really bright stuff underneath. Then I paint over it with a, a, like a 75% opaque white acrylic paint. And then that kind of dictates like how I can take in or, or, or let out some of those really bright uh, high chroma colors. And um, then I take out with the white and mute it a little bit, which is a technique that I stole from uh, an old roommate of mine who encouraged <laughs> me to so. And uh, it was just something I really fell in love with his work, like seeing the layers and, and totally different work, but uh, just using that white or, or another light color, like yellow ochre or something like that, and just kind of making it slightly less opaque than it came out of the bottle, and then just putting it over top, and then inking over top of that, either more colors or it's just straight black outlines, like, of course, the comic books taught me uh, in the beginning, which I actually did take a comic book inking course or two at PCAD. They were one was credited and one was non-credited. Uh, one was taught by a guy named Mark Lipka, and he did a really cool series back in the day. And he was he had worked with Marvel and other companies. And um, so I really loved that black inking aspect to any of these colorful pieces. And whether that separates me from a fine artist or an illustrator, I, I love, I don't really ever care about those labels. I just make the stuff I love to do. And I love putting black outlines on like everything. So. Uh, if you see a piece of work without black line outlines on it, like my mountain paintings or uh, some of that stuff, it was really hard for me not to outline the ridges of <laughs> those mountains and do that off. I love that offset printing. Uh, I love the off, like, because then you can have the color there and then do that offset with the black ink and then you get some white highlights or some weird color um, overlays and, and you can just do fun stuff when you ink. And I always encourage people to, to ink everything, you know. <laughs> So David, you said two things that will tie really nicely into the slide we're currently on, which are your bugs. Um, you had said that you love the cloud watching aspect of creating your work. And then you also said just a moment ago that when you leave something with no ink lines, it's really difficult for you. So yeah. <laughs> let's talk about these bugs because people love the bugs. <laughs> yeah, so they'll, like they'll, they'll walk to the show and they might, you know, they'll, they'll, some people do a quick breeze to the show. And then they go back and touch on a couple of things, but then they ultimately end up in front of these bugs. And yeah. they, and like, we've got, we've had guys, uh, there's one, one, uh, there's like one uh, patron in particular who comes in every week and spends every time Saturday. every Saturday and spends time with these bugs <laughs> and he just goes crazy for him. And I think like, you know, a lot of people resonate it with, like fly fishing, like they like they yeah. talk about like, oh man, like my dad or my granddad used to tie flies and these really remind me of them. Um, this one customer though, uh, likens them to um, like Japanese brush painting, where it's, he like he, he, I believe I could go on record and say his exact quote is, it's like he puts it down and he doesn't need to do anymore because he knows what he did was enough. And <laughs> so like I and I would agree with that I when I look at these ins, like these bug paintings it just looks like you know there were there was a definitely an element of play and and chance uh but then you took what was given to you and you and you alternate just enough to make it what it needs to be without overdoing them um, yeah. and I think that's a really uh important thing to be able to recognize because overdoing it for a lot of a lot of artists is something that they always argue with you know like how far do you go before it's done and then how little do you do before it's done yeah i think these yeah. bugs are, are a very good example of both yeah that and that is exactly what happened like 100 percent, exactly <laughs> what happened it was 100 percent a japanese technique style and reiteration creating the bugs in that theory of you know, what can we do next to make it part of a whole? And so that was what I did with those. And like the not inking them was the beauty in it for me because it was really, really hard for me not to. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, it, it's really cool to hear that. Like that, it really makes me happy. Um, 
the, the bottom, uh, the, the one that's um, the red one on the bottom, yeah. second from the right, is the very first one that I did. Uh, and that kind of sparked it. And then the, the next one would be, you know, the next color and then the next color and then go through the rainbow and then go through the rainbow again and then make a drab one and then make one that's muted and then add a little color to that one. And, and so I had them all kind of just laid out and they were bought with a very special pad of paper that I could never get again uh, from a company that does still exist. And it, it was just like, I fell in love with that pad of paper and I did all the drawings in like a night or two. Um, and it was really just very fun and I spent almost no time with them. And that was a professor of mine in college. Um, he said, do, do the work until you get to the last step and then take a step back and then it's done. And I tried to do that as a painter because this was all design stuff. So you could go on a computer and just, you know, delete it and bring it back and, you know, hit all your control alts and get back to where you were. Um, you can't do that with painting all the time, especially now with watercolor and not on this paper. And I used every single one of those pieces and there's not a mistake or a droplet, which is also uh, a feat for me. You know, I'm kind of messy when I make stuff. So these were very, very, very disciplined. Um, not in, in technique and composition in um, application in execution, like quite frankly, everything that the Japanese artists stand for that inspired me. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That means a lot. That means a lot that he said that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I know as people like rest on this collection, I, and we talk about it after they've had their moment with it. I'm like, this is obviously a restraint. And you can tell by all the other works in the exhibition that you love detail, that you love that inking, you love that line work. So this is something equally as important as those pieces, but it's definitely simplified in that sense, but still complex. Like yeah. there was a lot of, um, I don't wanna say planning involved, but it was all very intentional. Oh I yeah, very methodical, very methodical. Like I didn't, and I don't usually typically, I mean, my methods are, are always in whimsy and I always just kind of like throwing caution to the wind. That's the Bruce Banter way. Like that's just what <laughs> I do. And, and that's just, just part of my, my counterculture upbringing and just being my own authority uh, on pretty much everything, unless I'm at work or unless I'm dealing with family and, and friends that need special care and attention. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much like, like, let's go, let's, let's let it happen. Let's just do it and, and see what, what goes on and see what the reaction is. And not with any sort of malcontent or malicious intent at all, just really, and just let's make it, let's do it. You know, like we're, we're Nike up in here. Like we're just trying to make it happen. Swoosh through life, you know. One last thing, at least on this, when we, they're titled Bugs. Um, you were mentioning people see them as um, flies um, for fly fishing. Mm -hmm. um, we've also, and may, I don't know if it was us discussing it with another person in the gallery, but we also see them as like fossils, like these weird things that don't exist anymore, but they resemble yeah. things that are very familiar and they're like these fossilized silhouettes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to create, um, um, you know, in going off of that kind of like caution of the wind, I tried to create like, things that didn't exist that could exist and and the fact that they are kind of in that like vegetated state that kind of rigor mortis there that they they look very specimen like you know like they were laid out on a table with a little pin in them uh oh, at the north the way they're displayed <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah no i mean exactly i mean and you know that's one thing i got to say about it this the what you guys did with the paint um and utilizing the other aspects in your life to the other aspects in my life and bringing that cohesiveness into the whole part of that show, like it looks beautiful and it's because of that. Thank you. Thank you. It's big collaboration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. You're really great curators. Like your name fits what you do. Like you are a very good, you're very good at curating a show. Um, so I, I want to give it to them and give a hands up to them for making my work look better than I could. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I think, it, you know, it's something that, um, that interests both of us greatly. Like, we love going to see exhibitions. We like viewing art. We like, we like 
being engaged with it. And when the, when the work is displayed with care, that just, that's one more level of appreciation that was given to the work. And then that makes us as viewers appreciate it that much more. Like right. if we, you know, we, I think we've um, all walked into a space and, you know, the, the walls are a little dinged up or like the pieces are kind of a little crooked or they're, they're not exactly the way they need to be. And I think that that can sometimes get in your head as to, you know, like your appreciation of the work. So um, I, I, both Nicole and I take really great care to make sure that the work is displayed in a way that, that highlights the work um, and, and makes it, you know, stand up to um, whatever level of, of uh, I guess, uh, I don't want to say, it's not criticism is not the right word, but the, anybody who can come in and take a look at this can focus just on the work and they're not getting distracted by why is that crooked or how come that, like you're looking at a bunch of nail holes all around it or something like that. We really right. like well, to take that time. And you really do like create the worlds for the, each artist. Like each show you guys have had so far has been very different from the last and just really adapting to each of us as you would to a new medium or, you know, cause you guys are really true artists. Like, and, and that is, um, I think it's like a breath of fresh air. Cool. Well, right now we're resting on a slide that has uh, one of my favorite pieces in the, in the exhibition, which is Bird Girl 2. Uh, <laughs> I love, I mean, Bird Girl 1 definitely does it too, because that's, that's what we use for our promo. But right. uh, Bird Girl 2 has just got this, um, I mean, I think we've kind of touched on it in, in our conversation this evening, but it's got a fluidity to it. And it's got this uh, almost kind of like Rorschach-esque uh, quality to it where I imagine you like you laid down that water first now that I'm learning a little bit more about the process yep, you that was water down first and you got the shape down and then you laid in that ink in two strokes <laughs> let it did its thing let it do its thing and dry and then you went back and said what is this yep. uh, and <laughs> it's it's fantastic because the negative space that is underneath like I, I kind of think of it as the flamingo um, yes yeah, it uh, is yeah <laughs> so the negative space that's yeah. in Mingo's head perfectly uh, encapsulates the the face that's underneath it, but then the the positive space of the flamingo becomes the body of the of the figure. But so it's it's a body of a of a human esque figure, and it's also the body of a bird at the same time. Right. Uh, so it's like is is it is she wearing a costume? Is right. she part of it? Is it one being? Is it two beings? It is right. a diptych that's. You know, it, yeah, what is it? You know, and that's kind of, I've always loved that about my work. And pe people try to explain my work to me and, and that's all well and good. And I never get offended when they do, but it's, you're not wrong or you're not right. Like you're right all the time, even when you're wrong. It, it's what it is to you because of what it was to me. Yeah. I, I love it. I, whenever I find like a couple minutes to myself in the, in the gallery, as I walk around, I always end up on this one and I'm like, yeah, this one's just, it's got it. It's really And a uh, fun, fun fact for everybody out there. Um, these guys are also great art supporters. They actually bought a piece of mine that was part of this series before the show, well before the show, <laughs> uh, at, off of my Instagram story. So, you know, I, I did a couple of these and, and I always like to do a series. I always encourage you to do a series you will get better even at the first one you do is your favorite part of it it will be better for everyone else by like the seventh painting so you know I, one of my main part of my process is i do start i make a palette i get into a zone color wise and then i lay out five or six pads of paper a nine by twelve a five by seven a four by six we're working a hot press cold press smooth rough everything shapes cut circles squares weird stuff, deckled edges, ripped stuff, old stuff, painted <laughs> over stuff. We go in like six, seven, eight paintings at a time. And that is the discipline that's taught me. And then you can do some more simple work, so to speak, not to call it simple-minded or simple anything, just like easier on yourself work, but then work harder on more paintings. And then in the end, you can go back and refine them all and make them what they really need to be, but don't, don't do too much with it. You know. so that that actually sounds a lot like uh, the process of creating music, right? Like, it, it, yeah. Particularly from from what I understand of your of your music, it's a lot of 
you know, just like, just as you explained, you've, you've mixed the palette, you've got all the materials, like all the surfaces in front of you. Now it's a matter of, I'm going to do this over here and this over here and this over here and then see how it all comes together. Yes. Uh, I imagine that's, that's very similar to, the, you know, the practice of creating music. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And that's actually why, you know, and I've always been very into the cyclical nature of cyclical natures. So my studio is, uh, you know, just, I'll just do like a little once around and you can see that like my art desk was behind me, but now my, I'm sitting at my music desk. So, you know, this is like open all day and I can go and sit down and make music with my synthesizers and then come back around, swivel in my chair and, you know, make art back there. Uh, with all the beautiful stuff that I've purchased over the years, and a lot of it uh, from my dear friends over here. Um, so yeah, music, music was my first love. It's been been the art that I've been making the longest, and so that is why the Bruce Banter brand or whatever. You know, I went to graphic design school, so I, I learned how to market myself, which is why I went. And so it was fun to have that intent to go to college. I was in, in my late twenties. And I just wanted to do something with that. And I wanted to make a whole out of whatever I had bottled up inside. And it really took a long time to get there. And then a long time to get from that point to now. Um, and from now, um, I'm, I'm still in my 30s and I'm still growing and I will always grow. But I've always been inspired to people that hit their stride later in life because that's who I am. And I think that that's something that you can strive for and just incorporate everything in your life until it all builds together. And then hopefully it kind of snaps one day and you're like, wow, I can make this all one beautiful thing and make it very me, but also not me because it's really just all the influences that I've grown up with. And I think that's like the, the best part about it is it really just is a, the art and music that I make is a collage of the things that I love. And, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> so are there, is there anybody that you, you know, that you look to regularly? Like were there, were there early inspirations for you both musically or, or through the visual arts or like, um, I mean, I feel like a lot of, uh, a lot of artists kind of start by, you know, finding their, their people, right? Like they, you know, you, you always talk about like, yeah. like I can remember finding an art book in the library of my, of my elementary school and being fascinated by it, it was a book on Adelian, Adelian Radon and I have no idea what it was doing in an elementary school library right I remember looking at those charcoal drawings and being floored by them and I didn't even know what charcoal was at the time <laughs> nor yeah. could I pronounce the name of the book at the time uh, and it wasn't until I got later into high school that I found the artist again while doing a web search and I was like this this is the artist in the book um, so I think it's interesting, like, you know, you talk about influences and I wonder if there's anybody out there that has done that for you that you're able to speak to. Yeah. I mean, definitely Jack Kirby, um, early Marvel artists, Stan Lee, um, anybody that had their hand in on like just very graphic and bold colors growing up. So like just video games like Nintendo, um, like Miyamoto really kind of inspired me with just the stark colors and the minimal shading. Um, just early cartoons from the 80s, like a lot of the like Thundercats and He-Man, just very, very bright and colorful. And that's the same thing, like their artists had to create characters that had different attributes and color was a great way to separate all of them. And so I like fell in love with just the brightness of the colors and how the colors were able to portray the mood of the character or the room or whatever it was. And then, you know, as a synesthetic, like I can see colors and hear sounds and that kind of stuff, like, or, or you know, you know what I mean? Um, you know, that all kind of, kind of culminates and comes together and makes like this whole world for me. So like when I play music, um, I play on a synthesizer that was made three years after I was born and used you know, currently even in the Stranger Things. And so it just kind of never left it for me. So I've always been inspired by like that bubble of just color and creativity from, uh, from that world, you know, video games and art and culture and people, I think, individuals, not necessarily, but more just movements and, and genres of things. Cause I really like 
like the whole parts of all those sums. And so there's like, it's like Captain Planet and, and or like, you know, with your powers like, combined. Yeah, it's like, you know, with, with all our powers combined, we are, you know, this. Bruce this, Panther. And then, and then I can take the rings off and just go back to being just Dave if I want to. Um, when I plop on the couch and hang out with the cats and cuddle the dogs and just, you know, go to sleep for the night. So like, it's just, it's nice to, to have that. And, you know, Nicole and I were talking about the, the cycles of, of an artist and it's kind of nice to not be that for some parts of the year um, or even chunks of my life and then go back into it and, and get back into it and have a reason to, to kind of dust off the old uniform or costume as you will. And, uh, and just kind of do a couple of backflips for the people, you know. <laughs> a couple of backflips for the people. Yeah. And because I do it for them, I do. I I I think you know, and, and a, a great subject to touch on because of, of you know last month and the awareness of that goes on is that that art is a coping mechanism for a lot of us, and that you know mental health is supported by the things and creations that we make and the expulsion of the moods and feelings that we have. And I think that that's very important as an artist to recognize and to be empathetic to the processes of, of people. And I think that art has taught me that. That's great. Yeah, yeah, we were chatting a little bit earlier today of like, sometimes, uh, you, there's ebbs and flows to creativity. You can't be constantly on and constantly making because you need to live life. You need to find inspiration um, that then will help influence and re-energize work. Mm -hmm. um, that like we all deal with that in some ways. And I'm sure you even see from your students that maybe like, oh gosh, I don't even know where to begin like on a personal project because they've been like so focused on maybe doing right. really particular work for school that they have to like find themselves again. Um, that sometimes it takes time and they feel like there's something wrong with them. Yeah. If they aren't always making. Yeah. Yeah. And that was always the hardest part for me to just realize about myself is like, why, why do I not want to paint today? You know, and it's just like, you know, it's not anything wrong with anyone. It's just like, all right. And then you'll go and spread. It's like, remember when I was buying all that paper and you were like, wow, you really do a lot of work. And <laughs> it's almost like, and it's not a quality over quantity issue at all because the talent is there and the skills are there. So you can just pick it up and go like ride the bike now. So and you do build and you do lose and you do, you know, you can get out of habit, but uh, that muscle memory is there. And when you, when you pick that bike back up, like it really is fun to just like kind of let it go and keep going. And then like, you know, at the end of the trail, it's okay to just be satisfied with the work you've done for a period of time, you know, and you don't have to ride your bike every day. And, um, but yeah, man, when it's really nice out, <laughs> ride, that. ride your bike um, so to speak. but but yeah no and 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 that's the other thing like having supplies ready at a place like you is like really great because as soon as the art store closed down a lot of us were kind of just not necessarily working worried about making art but it was really nice to be able to be like oh man i want to make art today go down to the art store pick out like three or four new things make art with just that and that be the exercise which is something that you can do at at the gallery you guys have because you carry great stuff, you know? And so I, I think that, that having good materials is like, like you don't have to, like you can do, you can make great art with a number two pencil you got from high school. You can rip, you know, something apart and splat it on a page and manipulate it. And you can make great art out of literally anything. But I will tell you from my experience as a musician and dabbling with cocktails and spirits and things like that, seeping in quality into your art life is essential. And I think that that's some, as soon as I took that next step to spend the money on the supplies, getting the best paper I could, getting the best ink that I could, using the best brushes that I could, cleaning and taking care of them as I should, then I was able to really get into that upper echelon of my own personal creativity. Because like, and you got to start with the basic stuff. We all had crayons when we were five <laughs> and we could make great art with crayons when we we're 25 or 55. But like, you might want to get some Conte crayons. You might want to get some Prismacolors. You might want to spend some money on better wax. Like it's just going to make a difference. Yeah. And that's like my number one encouragement. If you can afford it, if you can work hard to get there and do that where well, you can afford it, like you work hard and get there, buy good stuff, make great stuff with it. Yeah. yeah you never know where like a new medium might 
take you and what thing you might un like uncover, discover with your work. Yeah. Yeah, like, just imagine like all your art supplies, like all your art supplies on your desk have like a little lock on them. And like <laughs> every time you use them, you take the yeah. lock off and like it just becomes this great interlocking web of unlocked locks that you can really use to your advantage. And like, I think that's what it is. And you can hear how I talk about my work. And so I use metaphors and I very live in this world of, of, of creativity. And like, I've always been that way. And uh, I talk a lot, as you can see, and that's the banter thing. <laughs> And so um, that comes from just like long cruises on back roads of just freestyle rapping to nothing about everything. Um, <laughs> and, and just incorporating that aspect into my work. And, and if you look at some of my older work on my website, which you can catch in my, um, uh, on my Instagram, uh, that I used to go real hard on real big pieces when it came to line work. And, and I've just kind of since not, I don't need that, uh, I don't, I just don't do it as much anymore. And I don't need to, I feel like I've done enough of it. And every now and then I get real detailed and you can see, and you can tell that I'm getting back to those roots of mine, but I really just love that Japanese aspect of just like, put it down yeah, and be done with it and be done with it. You know? And if you, wanna, you know, just zhuzh it up real quick and then be done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can, I can certainly resonate with that. I feel like, um, like in my, in my sketchbook, it's a place for like my own exploration. It's a place for my, my own, uh, I guess, uh, rediscovery. Like in my sketchbook right now, like I'm, I'm going real heavy with line work, just like filling pages with like the most detail you could possibly cram in before your lines just start becoming solid shapes. Right. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, the work that I, that I make, you know, quote unquote, seriously, like my, when I'm in the studio and I'm working, right. it's very much, it's very much, you know, just as you did, there it is. Here's the line. Here's, here's, the, here's the line. Here's the circle. Here's the permanence. Um, you know, kind of, kind of going back into something that we talked about early in this talk, you're, you had mentioned like, you know, when you're working digitally, you can, you know, control Z, control Z, you can go back, you can add things, you can undo things, you can go back to a blank slate again. Um, and I feel like there's a, and I, I talk about this probably a, a lot, um, but I feel like there's a responsibility that you have to the mark. Um, and like when you say, when you're working on the best paper and you've got the, you know, you've got a professional quality material in your hand, the last thing you want to do is, is disrespect the, the material by, you know, not being confident that the mark you're going to make is, is the one that you're going to be happy with. Not necessarily the one that you want, but one that you can work with. Uh, so I feel like, you know, working traditionally, you know, when you get all these, all these uh, materials together, and like you say, you get that vermilion ink out of the bottle, and you're like, I've only got four ounces of this. I got to make it work. Like right. it really helps to know that what you're about to do with it is, is going to work out for you. And I think, you know, people lose that responsibility or that that ownership of the mark when it can be so easily undone. Exactly. Um, and, and I think a lot of my earlier work, when I was just dealing with figuring out what pens did, I, I, I think we got really good at using pens because I would just use them. Like I would just doodle shapes and hatchworks and all this techniques. I just kind of like went through and wasn't taught. Some was taught. Like I just kind of liked playing with them, you know, and, and making them do whatever they could. And then I kind of like evolved into shapes that I would just kind of make because I would get bored with just making nothing or wasting paper. So then I would just use, I would try out a pen and make shapes with the patterns and then the patterns turned into hair strokes and then the hair strokes turned into a horse and then the horse hair stroke turned into a lady laying in the grass and then the piece was done. And now I have like all these new weird techniques in my repertoire that kind of like came organically through just playing with new pens. Um, and you know, you, you got your doodle tests at the shop and you know, you make three or four lines and then make three or four more lines and then I'll make a little circle and you're like, oh, that's a thing. Let's make it, let's make it more of a thing, you know? And that's kind of like my creative process. And, and sometimes it really is just like playing with a new pen um, and making pen strokes and then taking the pen strokes to the next level once I see something and then doing all the details, you know? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so David, with, the, with the last uh, maybe 10 minutes or so we have, 
uh, of our of our evening. Uh, what's like what's next, or what are you doing now? Like, do you you have are you more are you more uh, audio right now, or are you visual? Are you both? Like, what's what's going on in your studio? Um, I was talking earlier about Nicole. Like, I I haven't made any art since the show went up and that's just kind of a lot of what I do that a lot if I have a big show especially when it's like two months long I kind of like to let that marinate um I also don't like need to have like I have so much new work now especially a lot of this work was made during uh pre pre-covid and covid times um if it wasn't older work and and so I do have like a lot of work so I I have paper to use but I don't necessarily have a lot of place to store any more new paintings so um, <laughs> music is a big focus for me right now i just got my my studio set up uh for both audio and visual but i just really love making music so it's just been kind of a, a fun music making endeavor um, i taught myself digital production in addition to just making tapes and uh, i've been really having a lot of fun with that control z aspect of uh, of, of putting out a tune um, I'm still not using MIDI. I'm still recording uh, live audio samples uh, and, and playing the whole part. And if I mess up six minutes into the song, we got to go do it again. So this is back to that discipline. But at the same time, because of that, being very intent with the strokes that I make um, with the music that I'm making. So, you know, a lot of fun hip hop coming out of me right now. Um, it's kind of synthy based pop stuff, too. And uh, who knows if there's going to be any banter over it, but there's definitely banter in it. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, who's, you know, I don't know. I, I'm going to make stuff just forever. It's just like, I've always got to make stuff. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, and thanks for, for being a part of this little world that I created. Yeah. And, uh, and Dave, real quick before we go, uh, I just want to check in with our guest, Jeff, and see if there are any questions that he may have or uh, anything like that before we wrap up. Uh, no questions at all, but I mean, you know, just coming through the studio and seeing your artwork, uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely a lot of fluidity, a lot of uncanny figures uh, that it's just, uh, it's just a different dynamic and just puts you just in a different mindset and different comfort zone i guess and interaction that it's it's just out of the box and it's that's what is really intriguing to me about it so that's really awesome i love that you had that perspective of it i mean and that's just kind of how i've always lived my life it's like very much out of the box like i remember my parents telling me a story at thanksgiving last year and they're like you actually tested out of montessori school because you thought outside of the outside box and they didn't like that they they were like he's too anti-authoritarian even for us like and i and it kind of made me feel a little stupid as a kid because i didn't i didn't really didn't fit in anywhere really and and i just kind of became just dave because i didn't that aspect of me wasn't really didn't come out until i was like in my 20s um i didn't even really explore that aspect of myself because i was just like a normal kid until I was, until I graduated high school. And then like Matt was saying earlier in the conversation, like you find your people, I always think of the Blind Melon video, um, that no rain when the little yeah. girl in the bee yeah. costume finds all the little other people in the bee costumes. And I didn't find those people in my life until I was in my late twenties and they inspired me to bring these aspects out of myself. So that's kind of why I came out of my shell and thought it would do it justice as, a, as another person and then create a whole other world for other people to kind of immerse themselves in. And, you know, not all this stuff is connected, but because of me, it's me, it is. And the colors bring you in. And that's like, when you look at the paintings that he has up now, the colors kind of all go together, even though the themes might not. And that's kind of just how it goes. And I love that you recognize that and that you got to experience that. I also think that kind of ties in with the title of the exhibition too, you know, scenes from a technicolor world. You, uh, I mean, so I, we didn't even talk about this in the beginning, but this exhibition has been months in the work, in the works, uh, and really should have been up and down before it even went up because of, right. because of yeah, COVID. Yeah. So, you know, we had, we had agreed on works and then, and then we saw a new work and we agreed on that. And then it came time for the exhibition to go together. And, you know, uh, pieces came and pieces went. And then when we had what we had, it was like, wow, all of this can work together. We just have to, we just have to, 
it wasn't even a matter of finding the thread. The, there were threads all over the place. Mm-hmm. It, was right. just, it was picking up one that, that felt good and tugging on it and seeing where it went. Um, right. And when it came down to titling the exhibition, which is one of my absolute favorite things to do mm-hmm. ever, um, it, was a, it, wasn't, it was a challenge, but it was more just trying to find the right combination of words to say what I wanted the show, or what the, to explain what the show was doing in my mind, which was you've created this, this alternate reality or realities that are similar to ours, but not, uh, that are inhabited by all of the, the cast of characters that are in the exhibition and then some, um, but it was a space that, that didn't have any one linear direction. Like you didn't have to look at it from one direction and walk to the end of the, end of the show. You could just kind of pick and choose and drop in and, and pop out where you want. And um, in a sense, I, I guess that's really how I feel about video games too, like like Fallout or or any of the Elder Scrolls games. You can just drop in when you want and you can pull out when you want and you can come back whenever you want, whether that's months, weeks, years, or minutes. You can come right back in and feel like you never left. Um, and I right. feel like that's what this, when we walk down into the space, I feel it's like, oh, okay, we're here again. We're back in this You're world. Immersed in the world. Yeah, we're living with these with these mm-hmm. characters for at least another eight to nine hours, and then we can come back tomorrow and see them again. <laughs> right, yeah. right. I mean, and you will, and and you'll miss them when they leave. And like they'll, you know, and and there'll be beautiful new art and stuff. But it'll be you, you've made friends with them, you know, and they are or they're so organic. I miss them sometimes, you know. Like I, I like going to visit them. So like when Cat was like, "Hey, let's go get my dad a birthday card today," like. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. I go get to see them. Like, I know I'm going to get them back in a week, but you know, some of them I won't. I won't. Yeah, get some, some of them you won't. Some, some of them. I won't. Yeah, some of them have new homes. And that's they have really new. Homes. You got to say goodbye, right? That's right. <laughs> and so maybe with that we say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. No. Like, well, you always say goodbye, right? As Larry. <laughs> so you always say goodbye. Who doesn't say goodbye? Well, goodbye. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, David, thank, thank you, you so much. Time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Jeff, thank you for joining with yeah. us. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that, bud. Yeah, have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>